Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining uh, the next webinar of the Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. Uh, this time we have a great lecturer, Oskar Słowik. Uh, he will give an introduction to quantum programming with Python and Qiskit. So, as you know from uh, our announcements, this is also an introduction or a prelude to uh, to our quantum programming workshop that will start uh, on Saturday. Uh, so, I hope that many of you. I will also join this workshop, workshop or other uh, quantum programming workshops organized by uh, by QWERT and other Q cousins. Um, this meeting is recorded, so the video will be later available on our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, before we officially start, I would like to thank our honorary partners who also helped us in advertising this event. And uh, now I can uh, give a voice to Oscar our lecturer. So, Oscar, the Zoom is yours. Let's try to share your slides. I will, okay. stop, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Paweł, for the introduction. Um, in the meanwhile, if you have any questions to, to Oscar, also feel free to post your questions on our chat. And uh, after the lecture, there will be a Q&A session where you have when you have opportunity to ask your questions, but if you ask, if you post your questions uh, earlier on, on chat during the lecture, then maybe Oscar will also try to, to answer at least some of them. Uh, yeah, so let's let's start. Uh, you can, we can see your slides now, so we can start. Sure, thanks. So good afternoon. Um, my name is Oscar Słowik, and I'm a <clears throat> math student at the Faculty of Mathematics, Informatics and Mechanics, fifth year the University of Warsaw and a PhD student first year at the Center for Theoretical Physics and the Polish Academy of Sciences. My more work is mainly related with mathematical physics and mathematical underpinnings of quantum computing and quantum information theory. Uh, I started using QSCI in 2017 and it was <clears throat> when I was writing my thesis in I think it was uh, in computer science at the time. And I was implementing, using QSKIC to implement uh, quantum walks on, on graphs. And at the time, <coughs> QSKIC was much less developed than it's now. It had <coughs> much less um, possible options. And I, it's, it's nice to see how, how it's growing and how it, it, it's becoming more and more useful. So today I would like to show you some <clears throat> capabilities of QSKIT and try to give you some examples of, <clears throat> of, um, of problems which can be uh, implemented using QSKIT. I mean, we will use a particular example. So, the content of today's talk is the following. First, I will give you like a brief introduction to QSKIT and IBM Q experience. Then <clears throat> I will move to uh, quantum com information, quantum computation theory. I will just give you a bit. Next, there will be an introduction of a problem, some specific problem and its solution, quantum algorithm. Then we will implement it in Jupyter Notebook. I mean, I already implemented it, but we will try to follow. Then I will try to discuss more advanced issues, but we will see how, how um, much time we will have. And I will summarize. So the first thing is what, why and how. So the what of today is, is QSKIT and it is a quantum computing software and development kit and it's for working with IBM Q quantum processors, but it does not need to be uh, for used necessarily with IBM uh, hardware. In principle, it can be used for any quantum hardware. I'm not sure what is the very current situation here, but at least uh, in the end of the last year, it was, there was already um, a support for super con con uh, for trapped ions because the native platform for IBM is superconda are superconducting qubits. 
<clears throat> but at, at the time there was a first possibility to run it actually on on um, com quantum computers based on trapped ions i guess it was with a collaboration um with innsbruck uh, some experimental physicist group which built uh, ion based quantum computer now <clears throat> why qskit so according to the qskit web page qskit is the most and now here you can put feature rich modular open or popular quantum computing sdk i think it's definitely the most popular and i kind of can agree with the rest to some extent so how can you start your journey with qskit well you can just if you have pip then you can try pip install qskit it should work and it's the, it's the fastest way but maybe you would like to first um, maybe learn something before you um, you try using qskit so you can try ibm quantum experience this is um, maybe let's let's look this is the ibm's platform for quantum computing and it's very interactive and user friendly and you don't really need to know programming to try your um try give it a try and <clears throat> run programs on i mean simple pro very simple programs on using drag and drop um, GUI. So no, another thing is that, okay, so I won't log in to show you, but this is, this is the first place you can go. Let's go back. Another thing is qskit.org where you will find a, a lot of useful things like an overview, installation tips and configuration, also textbook, tutorials, which are a little bit more advanced than a textbook. And finally, documentation, which is just description of all of the of, of functions of QSKIT and how to use it, and it's very kind of extensive. Also, you can find a ways to contribute to QSKIT because QSKIT is kind of open, and you can try to improve things and to add your own stuff. So you can become kind of a QSKIT advocate, as IBM calls such people. Okay, so what? So some of the possibilities is to use a real quantum hardware. This is the first option, not necessarily IBM's, but it has to be um, equipped with some, some API to work with QSKIT. The first thing is online drag and drop thing. Uh, maybe I will show you it just for a sake of uh, you know, visualization. The second is obviously via your QSKIT API. And if you want to use uh, IBM's quantum hardware, then you need to have an account and get an API token. And you will copy, usually you copy just your API token to some place. I will show you how exactly. And then you can run on your computer. You can just send queries to, um, to, 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 to IBM's server and then it will be executed on a quantum computer. You can also use simulators, various, and these can again be done in a cloud using drag and drop or in a QSKIT. And again, you can divide these possibilities with respect to the level of access. So you have the basic and default gate level access, which we will use. So it will use just using gate-based circuits and algorithms. But you have also this higher access of level, which is the pulse level of access. And it is um, level at the Hamiltonian level of control. So you can define custom pulse shapes and sequences of these pulses. And this will enable you like to do much more advanced stuff, like to achieve optimal control, so-called dynamical decoupling or Hamiltonian tomography. But we will use, of course, we have, I mean, we will use this gate level so that we will just write instructions, maybe say something about the process of transpilation, 
because we have some flexibility here, but the pulses and things like that will be just used as uh, we'll use uh, just things which are um, given. So QSKID can be divided into four parts currently. When I was starting using QSKID, it was basically this Terra, which is, which is something which is now called Terra. So it's like the most uh, low level thing connected with just you know, uh, adding gates, measurements, compiling, transpiling, things like that. And there was just a basic unitary simulator there. Uh, also maybe QASM. But now you have like QSKID grew and you have these four pieces of QSKID elements as they call it. So you have some kind of water, uh, earth, <clears throat> fire and, 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 uh, and what? And air. So the Terra part is the most, as I said, it's just the most low level thing we will be using mainly today. Air is set of, it will provide you some nice um, simulators and also noise models. Ignis is mainly for noise mitigation and handling noise. And Aqua is kind of most high level part which has already implemented some algorithms like QAOA or, or variational quantum eigen solvers or things like that. So that you do not need to be an kind of um, know how to, you know, manage these gates and quantum circuits. You can just be an end user and, you know, try to implement somewhere um, already given quantum algorithm. To some, let's say quantum machine learning or whatever you, you like. Yeah, so maybe before we start, I will show you this drag and drop. And I need to log in anyway, so I maybe I will do it. Oh, okay. I'm doing this. It looks like this. You won't just spend much time on it. I just wanted to show you that you can, you know, just put gates on the registers and see immediately the measurement visualized on a, some sphere and also ideal measurement probabilities. So you can play with it without any, you know, without programming anything actually. Which is kind of good if you would like to test very fast, very basic circuits. Uh, of course, uh, and at the right, you can also see a quantum assembler code, I guess you see. So this is like also a thing one can use to program at a very low level. Just write a quantum assembler code. This is just, you know, uh, just a sequence of gates and to what re quantum registers these gates act on. So this is like this this drag and drop. <clears throat> so let's go back. So now we will I will give you we'll move to quantum physics um, like the very basics mostly linear algebra. So <clears throat> because if you want to program then we should at least try to understand what we are doing <clears throat> what, what these gates are doing and and why. So it's a nice intro to quantum mechanics and how one can understand quantum mechanics is as a kind of special kind of probability theory. In fact, um, okay. So you have this cohomogony of axioms in classical, in my, in, you can say that some theory, probability theory is cohomogony of probability theory. If it satisfies these three basic axioms that, you know, uh, the sum of all the probabilities of all possible events sum up to one. I mean, if you sum up over all, all possible events, probability is non negative, and if you have a dis disjoint events, then the probability will just add up. So, independent. So, we have two independent ways <clears throat> of achieving something, then you just add these probabilities. But in quantum mechanics, you also have something similar, but these probabilities are, in fact, amplitudes. And this, so, in fact, you're not adding probabilities, you're adding amplitudes, which are just quant some quantum, uh, some complex numbers. 
And the basic difference is that if you are adding amplitudes and if you assume that your probabilities are connected with the square of the length of this, of this amplitude, then you see that finally you will get <clears throat> this in my cursor, or not really. Can anyone tell me? Yes, we can see. see. Okay, great. Yeah. So you see, so the difference is that you get this interference term, which depends on the phase differences. If phi one and phi two are just uh, arguments of this of these uh, complex numbers and parameterized using amplitudes, so if you are adding two independent <coughs> events, for example, you can go to some point using two different paths, and you know this amplitudes of going, uh, so let's say upper using upper and lower path to some point, you're adding this amplitudes and but you get this interference term which depends on the, the phase differences so it can be positive and it can be negative which is kind of totally new thing because classically you would get only this first part and here you can have constructive or destructive interference which will modify your probability so this is like one of the ways you can think now <clears throat> a little bit more formal things so you probably all know what the qubit is. So this is a basic bit of quantum information. And it's like, you can think of it as a, let's say now a vector, it's, which lies in, in, in just C2. And we usually set the, the orthonormal basis for this space, which we call computational basis. So zero we correspond to, to zero bit and one we correspond to one bit, let's say. We will choose them in orthonormal way. And we use this bracket notation in, 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 in quantum physics. So this is, these are just, think uh, this, this cat, so this like guy which uh, right angle is just a vector. So you can think a column of now of, of its coefficient in the basis. And the bra, which is the thing which has left angle, is just the Hermitian conjugate. So it is, in physics, it, Hermitian conjugate is just written using a dagger. In mathematics, usually a star is, is Hermitian conjugate. So this will be, if, if that was a column, then it will be a row with uh, things complex uh, with coefficients which are complex conjugates so then in this way uh, if we write any quantum state of course we can write it in a basis with some amplitudes alpha and beta which are complex then we have this interpretation of the square of modules of coefficients which are the um, probabilities of obtaining zero or one because after the measurement, we, assuming we are measuring in the, this computational basis, we will get either zero or one, and our psi, which was a superposition, will collapse to either zero, probability P zero, or one. So this probability is just a square of the scalar product between my state and, and, and a state to which I can collapse. So in this way, we immediately see that from the preservation of the total probability, these squares of modules need to add up to one, so that we can parameterize any state. I mean, sorry, there should be call sign and here cat zero, and after a sign theta half would be cat one, and similarly here at the right, I, I forgot to put them. So you can parameterize any state using this because cosine squared plus sine squared to the same are going to be one. And because global phase is irrelevant, because if you are taking scalar product and of two vectors which has the same phase, so here this delta should be in the, in the, in the upper index here, then it will cancel. So I can also cancel this, this gamma. And this way I will get the parameterization here again should be cat zero and here should be cat one. There, that there is a one to one correspondence between my 
states in, in one, uh, of the qubit and points on the sphere because this is nothing uh, than just uh, spherical coordinates of the point on the sphere. If I will use these angles, then it will be one-to-one -one correspondence. And the most and uh, unitary operations, so operations which will preserve total probability, are of my interest because they, so they will uh, be using unitary operations. And these operations correspond to just rotation on the block sphere. So we'll, we'll start with a point on the block sphere and we'll always end at um, the point on the block sphere. And zero and one are just north and south pole of this block sphere. The most general unitary is of is the following form. And this corresponds, and in this way, I can get any rotation on the block sphere. It corresponds to uh, rotation on, I can get any rotation on the block sphere, so I can get any uh, transformation of my interest. I'm not gonna go into details of that, but if you know some things about covering groups, then you probably know this correspondence between special ortho orthonormal group and a unitary group or whatever. So <clears throat> a nomenclature here is that if I will have a scalar product of vectors, I will just skip this scalar product. And if I have this scalar product which will be between elements from the basis, then I will even skip this. I won't write two cases, but I will just write both in, this, in the same case. So, so if I have n qubit space, then my computational basis is just can be identified with the old bit strings of length n. Or I can also think about it as a binary representation of, of some integer in base 10 between 2 to the power of n minus two, uh, between 0 to 2 to the power of n minus 1. And also notice that if you have separable, not entangled state, then you can use just n block spheres to, uh, to, to just visualize them, which is kind of useful. And as I said, we allow unitary operation and measurements. In principle, you can um, also be interested in non-unitary things during the computation, like resetting your qubits or uh, doing things like that, or using some conditional things which are not unitary, for example. <clears throat> so in practice, we all, all, always what we have is some discrete set of unitary operations, which we call gates, which are universal for a qubit, plus some, or in fact any, gate, which is the two qubit gate, which is entangling. So it will, which is, it can convert states which are separable, so which can be written in uh, as, as tensor product of guys which lie in, in uh, one qubit spaces, to non-separable thing. So a vector which cannot be written in this form. So if you have any, anything like that, and any universal set for one qubit, then you have universal set for, for n in, or for n qubits. It's a theorem. Um, so you here now see the first problem. So the first problem is to how to decompose the unitary to these gates and we can do it effectively using solovay kitayev uh, assuming that this gate is for any universal gate set it would be like polylog uh, length required. But the, the, yeah, but but the point is uh, kind of how to how to ac actually decompose it. Okay, so the circuit-based quantum computing is is thing you already know probably. So we always start with we have some n registers which are called quantum register and they store quantum information as an input usually. Assume that uh, this input is like all zeros. Then we apply some unitary gates, let's say one or two qubit gates. Ultimately, we can always decompose it to one and two qubit gates. And then we do some measurement in the computational basis, so we will get a bit string. 
Yes, so we apply unitary to this initial state and we get final state. So one shot, so one, one application of this unitary and one measurement will give me one uh, count. So I can just, you know, write with what kind of bit string I got. And then after n shots, I will get a histogram which consists of n counts. And this is basically what I get from a quantum computer. So this histogram just in a limit of large n will, will approximate some probability distribution, which is given by these squares of the modules of our guys, which are in the in this psi. And I not we do not have access to these things. Okay, so let me recall just uh, two, two gates we will be using. So first gate is the bit flip or negation or X gate. So it just converts zero to one and one to zero. So it's like very, so it's an analog of not. So <clears throat> the second thing and it's very important gate is, is Hadamard gate, which, trans is, which is just the basis change as we will see. So it takes zero and it outputs zero plus one. So we have the same amplitude for both zero and one, and we call it a plus state. And we and one goes to also zero and one, but amplitudes and amplitudes have the same modulus, but they have different arguments. So the phase argument between zero and one is pi. And we this state we call minus. And now you can, so we can imagine that <clears throat> these amplitudes are like this. And you see if I will add plus to minus, then this the guy will cancel, which are uh, because uh, the guys, the one guys will cancel. And because, uh, so you can, from this way, you can see that if you apply Hadamard again, you will get the thing you, you put at the beginning. So Hadamard gate is its own inverse. And also note that plus state is an eigenstate of X with eigenvalue one and minus state is eigenvalue of X with minus. Because zero plus one, if I will negate, it will just always be also be zero plus one and zero minus one will go to one minus zero. So I will get a minus from, which is crucial. So please keep in mind that X, X on a uh, minus state is minus minus state because we'll use that. So this action of Hadamard gate can be understood as a chain of basis. And on the block sphere, it looks like this. Zero goes to plus and one goes to minus. In fact, Hadamard gate is just composition of two rotations along two, oh, oh, <coughs> but whatever. I mean, uh, along uh, these three axes. Now, we also need some entanglement. So, there are, so the first, the most important gate is the C node gate. So it's a gate, a conditional negation gate. So I have one qubit, which is my target qubit. So it's here and one qubit, which is control qubit. So this qubit will determine whether I will apply or I won't apply a negation. So if here it will be zero, the unknown won't do anything, no negation. If here there will be one, I will do a negation on this state. So I will get this state. And if I will have a superposition of whatever in this control, then I will get a superposition of results because everything is linear, which is pretty nice. And it's like a very important and crucial um, thing in um, property of quantum mechanics, in fact. So this is the description of the Sino gate. So it's like a block diagonal um, matrix. So here you have identity and here you have not. And the second thing is, okay, so you see that if you take a C node on psi plus, you will get minus, minus, uh, C node on minus plus, you will get minus, minus plus. 
I mean, nomenclature here is that the first vector is, is the guy from the lower uh, line, and the second vector is, 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 is the state in the upper, in the, in the register, which is above. So this is the situation. Because uh, this minus is an uh, eigenstate of, of x. Okay, you can always think C naught is just, sometimes it's called Cx, so it's controlled x, because naught is x. So it might be confusing, but it's just like a bunch of equivalent names for the same thing. The second thing is the swap gate, which just exchanges the state in between the registers. And it is important due to, for example, what we'll see later. Uh, some limitations of the topology of, of, uh, of our devices, but we will see later. So this is the, um, this is the matrix for the swap gate. And now we, will, we are going to <clears throat> describe this um, trick we will use to implement our algorithm today, which is called face kickback. So imagine you have an operator which uh, with eigenstate uh, psi or phi or whatever. So eigenstate of unitary operator is some phase, e to i uh, theta. So now imagine what happens if I will create conditional U gate and I will put on a control, I will put either one or zero, so then, then this will happen, that's obvious. But what will happen if I will take a superposition here on the control? So let's see. So this, this is just a linear algebra. And so I will see that the result is that this state went to that state. So the eigenvalue of psi, which is either i theta, kind of got kicked back to the control qubit. So in fact, you see that the target qubit is unaffected and it's the control qubit which got affected by the whole procedure, which is kind of like fun, <laughs> funny, <laughs> let's say. So this way you can, so this way, so for example, look what happens if I will take a control not gate applied to the psi state, nothing happens. But if I take the control gate applied to minus, then you see that the eigenvalue of minus, uh, because minus state is an eigenvalue of x with eigenvalue minus one, I will get here minus one. Yeah, and this will be very important. So remember this thing. Okay, and, and here are two circuit identities which are useful. So, and you should be, you should see it from this face kickback thing that this holds. And also another thing which holds is this thing that you can decompose swap into, into three C nodes. It's like very important now. So our problem will be the Bernstein Varizani problem, which is the following. Classically, it's a classical problem. We have an oracle that implements a function which goes from all strings of length one, binary, to zero or to zero or one. Can have, and it is given by just the scalar product between our, our string with some, another string, and we are taking it mod two, because we need, want to get either zero or one. And yeah, and our, problem is to find S, which is called the secret. So we do not know S, but our Oracle knows. And our Oracle is a black box we can send queries to. So we can add, uh, act Oracle about these values of X at any string of bits. And we will get, as an output from the Oracle, we will get this just only this value of a function on, on, on an input. Right, so you can represent it like this. So we are giving Oracle n bits and it output us at one bit, which is the value of f on x. Great. So how can we uh, make it quantum? 
how can we solve it this uh, this how can we design a quantum circuit for this problem so first of all because quantum computing is reversible let's change this thing which is certainly not reversible to the reversible classical circuit so this now is a classical circuit okay it takes string x it outputs the same string but and the value of f will be encoded using just just uh, just this Great. So you, you see that classically you need to use n queries to the oracle because the optimal strategy is to put a bit string which has only one only one one and the less guys are zeros because then the value on this thing will be s1 on the second view will be f2 and after n queries you will get the whole secret. And you cannot do it better because it all because Oracle always outputs only one bit bit of information, and your secret has n bits, so certainly you cannot do better. Now, so we will have a quantum circuit which will represent an Oracle. So this will be some unitary operation, and we see that we can do if we want to mimic this classical reversible. Uh, Circuit, we can try to do follows. We'll put our bit string so on, on, on things from the computational basis. If here I say some state in the computational basis, I want here to get a result like this. So this plus a means that uh, I'm taking everything um, mod 2. So here is an example. For a, so I'm fixing a secret, let's say 1010. So for 1010, I see that this circuit will, will give me the, the desired uh, thing here. All right. Because here, the negation will occur only if, uh, if S3 will match x3 and s1 will match uh, x1 and another guys won't matter yeah so this corresponds to the scalar product mod 2 and here i also have a because a might be 0 or 1 so whatever okay so i have this and i would like to have here my secret but what to put here and what to put as the initial state well we see that from the face kickback thing um, we should probably try to use hadavas and a minus because this way we'll be able to to introduce minuses which we want <laughs> so uh, so another thing to how, how why Hadamards are useful because you know if you put a wall of Hadamards here and it's, and it's a standard trick you will obtain all possible bit strings you will obtain a quantum state which represents all bit strings with the same amplitude but it's like no it, I mean it's not just in like argument but it's not the proof or whatever but it's like thing which often occurs because you want to query of Oracle on, on all possible inputs. Of course, it does not solve your problem, but mm, at least then, then there is a chance that you will retrieve this information. Uh, because you know, you have a state in which amplitudes you have uh, encoded the solution, you still do not have a solution. You need to find a, an, an intelligent way to retrieve this information. So it is just like why quantum algorithms are difficult. Okay, so the total, st if I put the oracle, I propose the, the our circuit would look like this. Great. So here is like the proof of what's going on. So as I said, our oracle on a state 
minus x will output our as something like this. And if you take a Hadamard on, on any string, it does not to be a secret, it's just any n bit string, it, you get something like this. So, so in particular, if we apply Hadamard to our n first qubits, you will get something like this. So after the first wall of Hadamard, so, so at this point, we will get just this because we apply identity to minus because this is an ancilla qubit, so-called, and, and Hadamard to these guys. Then after an oracle, I apply oracle to these and I use these thing. I will get uh, the following. And then I apply this wall of Hadamard again, right here. So because uh, Hadamard is its own inverse, I see that thing which is here uh, is, is the same as here. So it is just a uh, Hadamard of S. So this Hadamard will cancel and now we get S, which is exactly my secret. So you see, finally, you obtain the following state. And if you measure in this first, uh, in these registers, in this uh, <coughs> n first registers, you will get a secret, which is probability one, because secret will be just a state from a computational basis. I mean, in the ideal situation, you will obtain one. So you should get this after one shot, not after. So in principle, you, in, if, you, if you agree with that, that your quantum oracle is a little bit different than classical, because uh, then, and you count this number of shots this way that it will be number of, I mean, number of queries this way that uh, it will be just number uh, of shots here, then you can obtain a result after one shot. So in, whereas in the classical case, you needed like n classical queries, let's say. Okay, so now let's do some coding. So, okay, so if you want to use a real device, then you need to provide your API token. I want, here you see a part of my API token, so it's not dangerous, <laughs> but uh, so you can just do it this way. And here plug an API token you can find in your IBM account. Then they will have access to to uh, backends which are quantum computers, like IBMs. Then you do some initialization, so some standard libraries. You import R because we want to would like to use simulators. You import quantum classical registers and things like that. Quantum circuits and some guys for visualization. So let me, so I will do it like, like this. Here you can, in this way, you can check QSKID's version. So here you will get all versions of all packets. And here I will specify number of QDITs. So I will use, use four, and this will be my binary of it for a secret. Let's do it. And here I showed you two ways you can, you can, you can cut, uh, do it. So first you can, but since we don't have a lot of time, so maybe I'll show you this more, uh, more up-to-date way. So we'll just create one circuit for everything uh, at once. But you can also, here I wanted to show you that you can do separate circuit for Oracle and add it in it, this way. So it's a nice way of adding circuits, but whatever. So here, uh, we are implementing quantum circuit, and here we specify number of, uh, of quantum registers. So we need n plus one because we need also this one qubit for, for this minus state, I call ancilla. And here you specify number of, of, of uh, classical registers in which you will store the, um, 
bits of, of the uh, of the uh, measurement. Then we need to put ancilla in state um, minus. So we can do it by applying Hadamard and, and Z or, but Hadamard and Z is the same as X and Hadamard. And I introduced X and Hadamard so you can check that if you apply X times Hadamard on zero, then you will get minus state. Um, as well. Okay, so we need to apply this Hadamard before Oracle because we wanted this wall of, of Hadamard. Then we'll get, add barriers, which are not important, but we, it, it will be nicer to, to display. And here we have an Oracle. So first I will reverse this S because of, well, qubits ordering of, of qubits. And in case, uh, in a circuit, there is one, I will add a controlled NOT gate to my circuit. So you write your circuit and you write num uh, here, I, you write gate name. And this means that you're appending uh, gate to circuit. So maybe I should have said it, but I think that's clear. So here I added Hadamard on nth to, to the nth quantum register. I added Z to the nth quantum register. Here I'm adding uh, control node. And I need to specify a um, control bit and a target. So control will be Q bit and the target will be uh, N. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's execute it. Uh, and here I, and for, for now let's just keep uh, drawing, uh, adding measurements. And oh, I, okay, and the last thing I'm doing, I'm again adding a, a wall of Hadamard. So what I will get is this. <clears throat> this here is my oracle and I did these uh, barriers to display it neatly. I mean, if I will delete these barriers, then I will, I will get something like this. So, I mean, but it's not like this. So this is our ancilla. And he, this here we we, are, we will get we are here we will be doing measurement. But now I'm not adding for a, my, a while. I'm not adding measurement because I want you to I want you to show um, different types of of um, simulators. So the first so if you want to use a simulator, you're using first of all you need to specify backend to do anything. So the, the, let's look at this simulator, the unitary simulator. The unitary simulator to get, you use R, get backend, unitary simulator, call it simulator. Then to execute, you write execute, name of your circuit, which I call BV circuit, simulator. So here you get, put your backend. And then you do result. So here you'll get the results. And then you can, if you do the unitary simulation, it will give you the unitary of this whole circuit. It looks like this. And you now you understand why I didn't want measurements because if I will use measurements, then the whole thing won't be unitary. So it won't, doesn't make sense to ask for, for this really. I mean, it will give you an error. So similarly, I can use state vector simulator, which will output me the final state. And let's do it. Uh, let's plot my final state. This is the final state. So you have, you have, okay, so um, maybe I will decrease number of, of, uh, of qubits to be, this be more transparent. And also it will be better because we will be plotting things. So let me oh, redo this. Okay, you can also write it in a nice way using draw 
output MPL. Okay. <laughs> now let's do this again. Import error and inter simulator. Um, and state vector. Oh, great. So here I have a state vector. And here I use plot state city state vector to plot the total state vector before measurement. And you can see that on, on a diagonal, you have 0, 1, 0 and 1, uh, 1, 0. So this first qubit corresponds to the ancilla and the next two qubits correspond to the key. So you see that in both cases, I get the correct answer one zero and the difference is that in the first case I will I would measure uh, if I would measure an ancilla then I I mean I can get in principle two possible measurements on the ancilla uh, but I won't measure ancilla so <clears throat> so and now if you add measurement okay because I want to uh, find my secret. Then this does not really make sense to use unitary simulators. And But the state vector still makes sense, but it will be a state vector after the collapse. And because there are, yeah. So you see that there was a collapse of the wave function and I get on and I get two possible values. Why two possible values and not one? because I measured only two first two qubits and I didn't measure an ancilla. So I still can have, so my state is kind of like this still. Okay, another thing you can do is to plot a state vector. Uh, okay, a plot state is not defined. Uh, Not sure why. Maybe I didn't. Uh, maybe Polly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I added manually. And you, you don't need to do it this way, but I do not remember what to import to have all of them. Okay. So here, so here it is. And here you say the phase difference and it is indicated by color. That's the, another way, it's the poly vector. So it would be representation using an eigenvalues of all these poly matrices. And finally, you can use uh, free block spheres. Okay, I also didn't get this. I forgot what to import to get all of them, but okay, I'm gonna do it silly way. Um, yeah. Okay, so you see that <clears throat> you have one, zero, and an equal superposition of zero and one with the minus. So this is exactly what we have what we have more or less here. Zero, uh, yeah. One and sorry, one zero and an equal superposition. So is from from right to left you have one zero, and zero one with a phase difference of pi. So that's that why that's why it's on the block here, because this corresponds to the minus state. Great. 
So that was the visualization. But the most useful, uh, well, say not maybe not useful, but the usual way, the usual simulator you use is the quantum assembler simulator, which will mimic the thing your real device will do. So let me run this quant this thing. <clears throat> so you use backend from Air, you take quantum assembler simulator. We will, uh, we will take oh, just one shot. So we'll do one measurement. Here you do execute right circuit, your backend, which will be the simulator. Number of shots dot result as previously and get counts from the result and plot a histogram. So you see that in the ideal situation, because here there are no errors, no noise, and this is a perfect simulator, we will get our secret of probability one. Great. But life is not as nice. In reality, we need to face a lot of problems. Um, For example, the noisiness. So in QSKIT, you can also simulate, we can do a lot of things you won't cover, but you can easily constru uh, construct noise models. So you can put here, take a backend IBM Q Vigo, which is one of the quantum, uh, quantum computers available as a backend. Okay, so here I wanted to show you that you can uh, actually write, uh, ask for the properties of a backend. Uh, so let's do, yeah. So for each backend has, uh, maybe, maybe might, might have, it ha now this has five qubits so we can use it for our circuit because our circuit does not have more than five qubits. And here just have, uh, native gates for this. So this is the usual native gates for IBM uh, for IBM. You can also get backend properties and also different things from the backend. Here I have there are things which are co co uh, connected with the uh, decoherence, and this is it's important because you can use this data to construct noise models. But you of your device. But you can uh, also uh, kind of, yeah, but you can also, uh, for example, nice feature here is that you can construct a simulator and uh, fill it with a noise model, which is based on the actual backend you want to use, but you will be using simulator. And this, this uh, noise model will be, automatically constructed by QSKID based on properties of the backend. So you can get noise model from backend, from the real device, like this. This is like the encoding of this noise model. And now perform so-called error mitigation. So error mitigation is a procedure which allows you to because you have, when you have this noise model, then you can simulate noisy circuit, which will kind of resemble the real thing. And we can now look how the error mitigation procedure will uh, affect our calculations, which will be kind of more realistic. So the error mitigation, the most basic, in the most basic form, is about the, the errors of measurement. So during the, the process, you introduce a lot of errors due to uh, no, the gates, the noisiness of gates, the fact that they are not ideal and things like that. And this is very, it's very, very um, complex to, to try to understand this noise which is in the circuit during the computation introduced by gates because it can be very non-local and one errors can affect other errors and things like that. But in terms to the uh, measurement errors, it's, it's kind of easier. So in the, doing error mitigation, in the simplest error mitigation, we assume that we kind of have this perfect state at the end. 
and uh, and just before the the measurement it will be with some probability it will change to a wrong uh, the wrong output let's say this is assumption assumption so for the mitigation you use uh, ignis you import necessary things and you construct calibration function so you cal calibration circuits so a calibration circuit is a circuit which prepares a given basis state so you will have as many calibration circuits as you have basis uh, things you are measuring and then you will run this calibration circuit many times and because you know what is the ideal outcome and you know what the ideal outcome for every circuit is it is the state it should prepare but you will get some column with all possible outcomes probably this outcome uh, with, uh, which should be prepared will have the highest amplitude, but there also will be others. And you will get a column of numbers. If you normalize it, you will get a stochastic matrix of the process. If you invert this stochastic matrix, if it's invertible, or at least quasi-inverted, then in principle you can mitigate the effect of error of this, assuming that's like a stochastic process at the end. So let's look how it works. Our state labels, um, sorry, so here are we, I'm putting a qubit list and I'm get, generating calibration circuits. So look at, we look at the labels. We have four labels because we, we are measuring four, two qubits. Let's look, for example, at the, at the, at the second calibration circuit. So it's look like this, it just prepares 0, 1 and then measures and we expect to get 0, 1. Of course, we not always get 0, 1. That's the point. So let's execute the calibration circuit without noise using the CASP simulator, but without noise. So, and let's plot it. This, this is an identity matrix, no else. Now, but let's look, now let's execute our circuit using noise model from the real de device and look at the counts without mitigation. You see that there are some probabilities of getting zero, zero and one, one. They are small, but nonetheless, we would like to do better. Um, maybe I will, okay, maybe, yeah. I will increase number of qubits to make this difference bigger. Mm. Okay, so I will we'll take we'll take four as in in our initial project. Yes, and I need to do this circuit again. So let me do it. Check. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. So we need to Yeah. Let's execute it. Uh yeah. Again. Oh, okay, so here are some more things that are going on. Still, 1010 has the highest probability. Now execute the calibration circuits. So here we will collect all the counts for all calibration circuits with our noise model. Calculate the calibration matrix. Maybe we'll plot it also. You see it's not diagonal. Maybe you want not see, but don't see, but yeah, it's, it's not. Uh, there are some non-zero guys here. Now, we'll calculate the filter. So if you have this calibration, we can calculate filter. We and you can apply it to the row counts. So it will be, and let's look what will happen. This is the row versus mitigated. You see mitigated is much closer to 100% for the correct answer, which is kind of nice. 
Okay, and finally, um, here I have a uh, couple more advanced things. Mm. But before this, maybe we will go back to the presentation because I would like to introduce some things. So things we neglected until now is the QSKIT compilation pipeline. So we would like to, you know, write these circuits, which are kind of virtual, but then they need to be executed on a real device. And this device has a limitations. For example, each device has a certain topology. Um, so let's look. <clears throat> For example, here you have all possible backends. And for example, our Vigo looks like this. It has five qubits. And these arrows indicate the connectivity. So only guys which are nodes which are connected can be applied to you can only apply C node to guys which are connected with, with uh, an arrow. Moreover, if, if there can be, it can be this, this graph can be direct, directed so that, for example, only one of those two connected can be a target and the second one need to be uh, just a control. But in this case, it's a symmetric. But anyway, it's not possible, for example, to do C0 between 0 and 3 and things like that. But we don't like to think about such things when we are doing, you know, writing a circuit. But moreover, the basis gates are U1, U2, U3, control X and identity. This U3 is the, just this most general rotation I told you at the beginning. U1 and U2 are specific, just uh, some special cases. But the point is that you need to kind of translate, your program needs to kind of translate this circuit first of all, to this topology, and second of all, to the basic sets. So this is the first problem. So this is, it is done by, by, by the transpiler, but also transpiler does many other things like optimization. And here you have like, you know, things, things is adjusted to the topology, things which uses only native gates and things like that. And then finally, there's a scheduler, scheduler is based on that will generate pulses, like a microwave pulses, which will, you know, hit those superconductive things if you are using IBM and do, do stuff actually, do the magic. <clears throat> and this way it can be nice because, you know, we are writing this circuit. This is some virtual circuit, some virtual qubits, which need to be, you know, physically mapped to some physical qubits and things like that. And then you can, you know, get one backend, for example, IBM device, do the transpilation, get something like this. Get, get some, you know, ION computer from Innsbruck, do the transpilation and get this. So we would like to, you know, code once and use multiple backends, which is important. And this is why transpilers are very important. And also they, they make our lives easier because we can concentrate on algorithms and not on, you know, how to do optimal decomposition of stuff and things like that. So the cycle which is going here, in fact, is the following. You have some high level algorithm, for example, for example, some you are doing some quantum machine learning, whatever, but you maybe not do not have some high algorithm, maybe you are using your own thing, but you have something, assume from, for example, assume well you are using some high level, it will 
it has some quantum circuit. For example, uh, there is, it's, it's, let's say it's already implemented. Then there is a transpiler, which first of all, cancels redundant gates, decomposes to supported gates, so to the native set, map to the connectivity graph, I had told you, and do another things, which are connected with the optimization. Then there is the schedule, which is shapeless pulses. Then it's our object. Finally, there is a device. So either it's like a simulator, which can be CAS pulse simulator. Okay, pulse simulator is another thing, but uh, we, we, are, we, we are not covering this kind of access. A state vector simulator. Then there is a job, result, noise mitigation, and, and you know, and uh, it goes back to the algorithm. So this is kind of the cycle which is going on. And this is just for you to know what the transpiler does. So the transpilers is consist of some, some set of passes. And these passes are, can, you know, each pass is some kind of operation and they form a pipeline and they can be, so the, basically your pipeline um, can be made in very, in many ways because you can use the same types of passes uh, in, in different places many times with different parameters. This is here is like a simplified, like, like an idea. For example, what, what kind of things you can do in these passes. So you are, you are, so this is called virtual circuit because it's like, you know, not, does not have any, might may not have anything in common with the physical device. So you have a virtual circuit optimization. You need, if you have any, for obviously any qubit, gate which is more than uh, two qubit, then it need to be decomposed. We need to it place your virtual qubits, map them to the physical qubits. You need to solve the problem of routing on restricted topology, because if you have use uh, thin knots between guys which are not connected, then you need to connect them using swaps or something. And this is problematic because uh, you, need, you know, you need to connect one of them using swaps to a place where you can apply C0 and you do swapping again to put it back, right? So it's very messy because swaps uh, are very costly, costly and, and nasty because they are noisy, at least for noisy intermediate scale quantum decide gates, which are very cost costly in this sense. So one of the things we would like to do like kind of a heuristics is to minimize number of such swaps. So we're gonna still see it's very it's kind of complicated. Then you need to translate to basis gates, do do finally physical circuit optimizations. You can do it in many ways. And QSKIT is nice because it's, it allows you to either use predefined pipelines with selected level of optimization. So you just input an integer between zero and three, and the transpiler does a thing and <clears throat> The higher this number, the higher the level optimization, but it takes longer time. So you, if you have very complicated circuit, you need to think about this trade-off between uh, wasting more time for transpilation and having, for example, circuit which has smaller depth. But you can also build pipelines using existing passes or define your own new ones. So you can build your custom pipelines and use them using existing passes. So this sets, you, you, this, this pass is, each pass is a kind of operation. Or you can even define your own pass, passes. So we can see a tutorial. And so as you see, the devil lies in the detail. So we have this backend property, quality of qubits, direction of signals, physical gate sets. We have this transpilation process. And uh, we can sometimes need to do some tomography, for example, to do better error mitigation, not the naive one I, I, I gave you. And QSKIT also allows you to do things like state process and gate tomography. So the tomography is kind of thing you use when you, you know, you have, a, you can, for example, you want to know what the state is based on the measuring, or you want to know what the circuit unitary looks like based on the measuring it and things like that. So it's, you have noise models, which can be custom or based on backend or whatever. You can experiment with your own noise models and, and things like that. You have error correction, 
for example, repetition calls or think more complicated things, which will be crucial if you want fault tolerance and if you want to have good error correction, you first need to have good models of your noise. I mean, you need to understand the noise which is in, which is in a system. And the noise mitigation and things like that. We, and <laughs> so these are things you need to uh, take care of in the real life. And then if you want to do things non, in a good way, not na naive way. And QSKIT addresses all of them at least partially. At, it, at least it tries, let's say. <laughs> I think QSKIT is growing and it's nice and I think it, it might be very, very, very nice and useful uh, packet. Okay. Um, I think we are heading towards the end slowly. Um, but so maybe, but maybe we still have some, because I have a summary, but I can now still... We still, still have time, uh, Oscar, so please go on if you want. Yeah, okay. So I wanted to show you how to use, for example, these tutorials, because they are really nice. So things which are in this uh, qskit.org, if you go. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, you have an overview, things like that. But if you click learn, you have two things. I mean, you have more things, but because you have you know, these uh, videos, things like that, but you have this blog, but you have textbook and tutorial. So the textbook is more like a, you know, textbook. So it's like more, about the theory and basis, basics like you have like quantum protocols here, you have a total introduction from zero, uh, things uh, we covered more or less, mm, you have some introduction to quantum error correction using repetition calls, measurement error mitigation, things like that, which are uh, kind of uh, basic here. Finally, you have some of the high level things like uh, quantum algorithms and its applications, so things from from uh, from this most high level packet. Um, and also things related to with this pulse level um, in control. Yeah. And in the in the tutorials, you have even more. You have more advanced things. Uh, for example, maybe maybe let me just rest a little bit different. Um, so, for example, here you have thing about transpiler passes and pass manager. So you can learn about all of these, uh, for example, how to get all possible passes, which are predefined. What they are doing is in the documentation. So you see it's pretty rich. You can look, uh, you have here some codes you can, you can uh, plug and play and, and look, for example, what is, how the basic swap change is different than look ahead swap or stochastic swap or another another uh, things which are uh, another possible passes. You can also uh, ask your um, transpiler to give you a logs, what kind of passes it's using and, and things like that and everything. <clears throat> also in the high performance analysis, you have, for example, things about, about the building these noise models, device backends, and uh, things like that. And here you have measurement mitigation, things related with, you know, just uh, more hardware level thing, uh, uh, problems. And if you want to go high level, then you have some optimization tutorials, things towards uh, quantum machine learning, and finally, this the highest level will be, you know, specific problems like finance tutorials or in chemistry. So, for example, in chemistry, you had also previously in the in the in the textbook you had, for example, the variational quantum angles eigensolvers. 
uh, implementation of things like that, which can be used in quantum chemistry for estimating the, the ground state energy, so things like similar things. <coughs> Um, yeah, so maybe we'll go to the summary now, because I think you can, you know, you should do it yourself. There, there are, I, my intent was to show you that there are a lot of things, and QSkit is pretty uh, rich right now, and you can take your time and look at the possibilities. Um, maybe I'll show you just how this result looks like. So I took our, um, you, of course, you can finally, you know, put it on to the real device, which I didn't, but usually it takes some, it takes some time because there is a, a queue, for example, 20 minutes or something I waited two days ago. So I don't didn't want to do this now, but um, you should know how to do it. So obviously you use this backend and you need to take a provider, load to your account, take a provider. You take least busy uh, backend, which has, you know, not than five qubits and at least two, let's say. I mean, I can take more than five qubits, but it, it's just like, you can specify. I mean, from the configuration, you have access to the config configuration of all guys, because this will give you a list of all the backends, which are, and you can find, for example, those which have some specific uh, things you are interested in, for example, and in particular, which operation or which is important and output your least busy backend and then just use your backend as, as just as a simulator. So you take set a number of shots, do execution, put your circuit, backend number of shots, take a job monitor, finally get counts, plot a histogram. And if you do it, you can, you all, it will be saved on your account. So a day ago, I, I used IBM Teams, I guess. And I ran this uh, circuit, the, the very circuit we wanted. And this is the result. And yeah, and I chose 011, you need to believe me. <laughs> so you can look at the real counts. Uh, you look at the diagram of the circuit which was in fact implemented. So you see it's different than the circuit we, we programmed at the high level, at the virtual level, let's say. It has U2 gates and like some nasty swaps, some nasty C nodes, which are, which were optimized. So if you want to specify the level of optimization in the transpiler, the default is one. So uh, it's like, you need, you need to look at the documentation to, to, uh, to see what these levels mean. But you can look at your quantum assembler code for this circuit, which is uh, after this optimization. Um, yeah, things like that. So let me go to the summary. Oh. Yeah, different topologies, as you see. Maybe we'll see whether there is this old old guy I used, uh, but I think it's now out of service. My first is absent. So, oh, here it is. So you see this. Oh, but I see that now there are these arrows are two have two ways, so I don't get it. Kind of. Anyway. Um, let's summarize. So what we learned, or at least I wanted you to, to take from this, is that we learned a basic tr trick, which is a phase kickback, which, which is used in many quantum algorithms. We implemented the Bernstein uh, uh, Vazirani algorithm using QSkit and run it using various simulators and also a real device. I mean, I run it on a real device, but I showed you how to do it on a real device and I showed you the results. We performed like very basic error mitigation on a simulator and the simulator was filled with a backend back based noise model, which we neatly got using, nice, uh, very easily got using QSkit. 
We also learned some of the basic functionalities of QSkit, of course, today. I think it's kind of safe to say that QSkit is currently pretty developed and offers some high level ways of dealing with problems. But you have also a lot of way to customize QSkit and try to do things better at a low level. For example, play with the transpiler and try to do things which are better than the predefined stuff. You can experiment with a couple of IBM quantum computers for free. You can contribute to QSkit if you want. And I think QSkit is fun as well. So, uh, so thank you. And that's it. And now I'm waiting for um, possible questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Oscar. It was a great lecture, great talk. Uh, so indeed, let's now try to uh, answer some questions. Uh, so there, there was an interesting conversation on our chat. Um, yeah, there were some questions about uh, the workshop, so I will answer later because I will be advertising, announcing these workshops once again. Uh, so let me find a technical question regarding the presentation. It was a question about uh, certificates for the participation, and uh, not this time, uh, not for not for this uh, meeting. There will be certificates for uh, completing the workshops. Um, as I replied, uh, there was a question: Will this Jup Jupyter notebooks uh, be shared as well as the slides? Uh, Oscar, how do you think? Do you want to share uh, your notebook and slides? I mean, it's no problem. Mm -hmm. But a majority of the code is taken from uh, from um, either tutorials or textbooks. So, but okay, but I can send it. I mean, okay, the way it is there, it's not available. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, there is a question about the block sphere. Uh, if zero state and uh, one state are orthonormal, why are they uh, one hundred eighty degrees apart? Uh, in block sphere. Yeah, sure. So, so the point is that um, <laughs> this okay. has nothing to do with the the scalar product on the blocks here has nothing. I mean, it's not like the scalar product in a in a you know three dimensional uh, space yes. or the standard it's, it's scalar another, product. It's in, another space, right? It's uh, another. It's a scalar product in in C two, so it does not need to. You know. Yes. So the block sphere is just a visualization of quantum states in uh, R3, let's say, in three-dimensional space. But the scalar product is, uh, or or this orthonormal base, or this uh, the space of, of quantum states is in fact in uh, um, in a um, in another in another space. space. Yeah. In a, in a, yes. It's a Hilbert space over complex numbers, two-dimensional Hilbert space over complex numbers. I guess we can say that. Uh, all right. Yes, yeah, so it might be confusing, but anyway, uh, the block sphere, uh, the functionality of block sphere is that um, you, you, you use it to for visualization of, of, the, of the unitaries you apply. It's, yes. it's nice. Yes, because, correct. for example, uh, if you have poly matrices, which are X, Y, and Z matrices, they correspond to the to certain rotations along X, Y, and Z, Z matrix, Z uh, axis, respectively. And you can represent any relevant unitary. I mean, mm -hmm. up to a global phase, using some rotation on a block sphere. So, and each rotation represent, uh, corresponds to, to some unitary, so. Mm -hmm. All right. It's not one-to-one, -one, but if you uh, neglect the global phase, then it is. So okay. in, in our case where we are interested in quantum states, so they are up to the global phase, then you can do, then. Mm -hmm. All right, there's a question. What is a real life use case for the application of present classical quantum algorithm? Uh, I'm not sure that was a question from Dominic. I'm not sure which algorithm was exactly in mind. Maybe this Bernstein-Vasirani uh, algorithm. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, probably 
probably it was so Bernstein Verizani is just a generalization of of Deutsche Oscar. So these are kinds of algorithms which are not really useful <laughs> in a practice, but they are of great theoretical importance and like motivational importance because they show us like a clear kind of supremacy of quantum algorithms. So uh, you know, one shot versus n shots or, or uh, things like that. So so okay. so they, they are they they are easy to understand and they you can easily um, understand what's going on and why and also understand the importance of, of the result and the impact. And okay. So this is it's not like a real problem solver for okay. uh, this, this algorithm. That's cool. There were also some replies that maybe it can be used to solve uh, NP problems, but I guess that at least not directly <laughs> for sure. Um, there was also a question about whether the qu global quantum programming workshop will be also based on Qiskit. Yes, it will be also based on Qiskit. If you want to do projects or apply these quantum algorithms, is there any online community which can help with this? And there was a reply that Qiskit platforms on GitHub is a good starting point for quantum algorithm uh, projects. Uh, I can also add that uh, there is a keywords community to which you can join if you want. Uh, I will also send you a link. So in fact, this is, uh, uh, this is a website where there is also an, an announcement of, about this global workshop. Uh, so you can also join uh, Qword. We have, we have a, a public uh, Slack which you can join and meet other people interested in quantum computing. So I believe that many of them uh, are currently working on um, some relevant projects. Uh, Oscar, I know that you are also working on uh, quantum random walks, for example, in Kiskit, right? I'm not sure if this uh, project is still ongoing or maybe there are some other interesting projects you can recommend. No, I guess it's still going. Um, I mean, I can see some possible uh, things we can go, mm -hmm. put it, push it, how to, can we push it further? But it's not like things I'm doing like, uh, in mm -hmm. my work right now, in my research, so I can treat it like as a, like a side project. Um, but for for people who would like to learn uh, how to use Qskit on a low level, I think it would be kind of very educational to at least understand how this code loop works and maybe try to extend its, um, right. our, its, its domain of... of uh, mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I can, uh, uh, Oscar, if you're interested, you can also later add some links to some interesting projects to your slides and then we can just, um, we can just publish um, your slides on uh, the website of the Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. Yeah, but I, I will just uh, change. I will just uh, correct some typos because okay. obviously there were some. At yeah, least on this slide, there are at least. Yeah, that's, uh, that's perfect. That's perfectly so, fine. Are there any more questions to, to Oscar? If not, then uh, let's thank once again uh, Oscar. Oscar, thank you very much, and I will just share several slides um, about our workshops once again. So just uh, give me a second. Let me first share my screen. Yeah. Um, All right, so yeah, as you can see, we have our workshop organized by, uh, by Poland and the Quantum AI Foundation starting this Saturday. Um, there is a website with a description in Polish. So as I said, this workshop will be entirely in Polish. So uh, some materials will be available only in, in English, but uh, the lectures and mentoring will be in Polish. So this is mostly for, for people from, from Poland. And you can still register until Thursday. 
uh, but for people from other countries or for people who are not uh, Polish speakers, uh, you can also join a global workshop organized by uh, QWORD. So QWORD is an international organization uh, which we are also part of as QPoland. And this workshop will be um, on the six days between 23rd and 28th of, of November. Uh, and as far as I know, it's still possible to, to register. And uh, please do visit the website of QWORD because uh, I know that there are also some other uh, workshops uh, organized uh, now in November as a part of so-called Q Challenge initiative. Uh, so uh, there are there are similar workshops organized by other um, groups, quantum groups from from other countries, and I guess that um, some of them might be also uh, in English as well. Um, so if if some other dates are are better for you, then that might be a better option. Uh, and uh, anyway, in, in two thousand. 21, we'll be also organizing um, some other workshops. Uh, we have a workshop dedicated only to high school uh, students uh, in plans, so it will be um, a bit uh, easier and simpler. Uh, but uh, there will be also an open general workshop uh, for, the, for the global audience, and uh, maybe next time it will be entirely in English. We'll see. Uh, so that's that's all. We would like to thank once again our honorary partners for supporting us in advertising this event. Um, as you have seen, we had uh, even more than 80 people at some point, so this is quite nice, quite a nice number. And so uh, we invite you to subscribe to our uh, channels, join our Facebook group, follow our Facebook fan page, uh, Twitter profile, YouTube channel. Uh, as I said, uh, We'll soon publish the video recording uh, on our YouTube channel, so stay tuned. And uh, we hope to see you um, during our workshop uh, and during our next meetings. The next meeting will be probably in December, um, more or less in the middle of December, but uh, we'll see. It will be announced later at the beginning of December. Uh, so thank you for for your attention. Now I stopping sharing my slides and if there are no more questions i don't see more questions i think we can also officially stop recording so i'm not stopping recording